Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Intermediate Algebra. This is section 7.1. We're going to look at solving quadratic equations. Now, quadratic equations in standard form are ax squared plus bx plus c, and we set them equal to 0. Now, when it comes to quadratics, hopefully we're very familiar with factoring, because that's going to be our first tool that we use in order to solve a quadratic equation. Now, Quadratic equations in standard form, we should be able to identify a as the coefficient of the x squared term, b as the coefficient of the x to the first power term, and c as a constant. Now, if we look at this equation, our first example here, the first thing we want to do is set it equal to 0. By doing so, we just subtract 4 from both sides, so we get x squared minus 4 equals 0. And if we identify a, b, and c, a, in this case, is the coefficient of the x squared term is 1. There is no x to the first power term, so our coefficient there is 0. And our constant is a negative 4. Now, to factor this, hopefully we identify this as the difference of squares, because x squared, of course, is a perfect square, and 4 is 2 squared. So it's the difference of squares, and hopefully we recall that that factors to x plus 2 x minus 2. Now we can use something called the zero factor theorem. Well, the zero factor theorem is a fancy term that uh, explains something that we should already know. 0 times anything is 0. So if this factor, this quantity, is 0, then 0 times anything will equal 0. Same thing here. If this factor is 0, 0 times anything will still give us 0. So if I set this factor equal to 0, I can solve for this x. What plus 2 would give me 0? Well, if x is a negative 2, negative 2 plus 2 would be 0. And 0 times anything is 0. And if I look at this factor, I can set this equal to 0 and say, well, what minus 2 is 0? Well, a positive 2. So we have two values for solutions. We have negative 2 and positive 2. And we should always check our solution. So I'm going to check negative 2 first. Negative 2 squared is a positive 4. So this would be a true statement if x is negative 2. If I test positive 2, 2 squared is 4. That's a true statement. So I found the solutions by factoring. So to solve by factoring, these are the steps we essentially do. We want to set the equation equal to 0. And that is essentially putting it into standard form. Then we want to factor it if it is factorable. Use the zero factor theorem, essentially set each factor equal to 0, and then solve for those values of x and check our solutions. So if, we're, if our factoring skills are strong, we're going to uh, be able to solve by factoring relatively easily. Now, another property we can use is called the square root property. We're going to look at that same example. The square root property is if we can identify a perfect square, such as we have here, x squared, we can uh, isolate that square factor, which in this case, it's already isolated. And then what we can do is take the square root of both sides. So if I have x squared equals 4, if I introduce a square root, one thing I have to always remember when I introduce a square root to an equation, there are two possibilities, plus or minus that square root. Because two negatives multiplied together will give me a positive, and two positives multiplied together will give me a positive. So when I introduce a square root, I'm always going to remember plus or minus. So the square root of a squared factor is just that factor. And here, we can simplify this. The square root of 4 is 2, so we'd have plus or minus 2. Now, this got us the exact same solutions as we had before. So we know they work, but it's always good to check it. Negative 2 squared is 4. Positive 2 squared is 4. Both of these solutions work. So this is another method that we can use to solve quadratic equations if we can isolate the squared factor. So just to review those steps, we isolate the square factor. We take the square root of both sides. And we don't forget plus or minus. We've got to have that. Then we solve for the x term, and we check our solutions. 
Let's look at a few examples where we can use the square root uh, property. Here we have 4x squared equals 48. Well, if I can isolate this x squared, I can use the square root property. And I could do that by dividing both sides by 4. If I divide both sides by 4, 48 divided by 4 is 12. Now I can use the square root property. If I take the square root of both sides, the square root of x squared is x. And the square root of 12, I have to remember, plus or minus the square root of 12. Now this radical can be simplified. So I would get x equals plus or minus. This contains a perfect square factor of 4. This is 4 times 3. I can take the square root of 4 to get 2 square root of 3. So it's not a nice integer like the first example we looked at, but it is a solution. We have positive 2 square root of 3 and negative 2 square root of 3. We should always check our answers. So if I go back to this and I put in 2 square root of 3 and I square it, I get 12. 12 times 4 is 48. That's a true statement. So if I do the positive or the negative, because I'm going to square it, the negative uh, will give me the same solution. So I know both of those will work. So always check your answers. Now this one here, this uh, squared factor is already isolated. x minus 3 is being squared. So what I can do is I can introduce that square root. And I'll do it right here, the square root of this side, plus or minus the square root of the other side. So I introduce that plus or minus when I have a square root. Now, take the square root of a squared factor. It just gives me the factor. And the square root of 49, because this is a perfect square, I get plus or minus 7. Now, there's one additional step that we didn't have in the other examples, is I still need to isolate x to solve for x. I'm going to add 3 to both sides. x equals 3 plus or minus 7. What we have to realize is this is not simplified. We've got to take it a little bit further, because these are like terms. So x equals 3 plus 7, which is 10, or 3 minus 7, which is negative 4. Let's check these two solutions. 10 minus, or we'll, we'll go back to the original here. Let me get rid of these square roots so we don't get confused. 10 minus 3 is 7. 7 squared is 49. That's a true statement. What about negative 4? Well, negative 4 minus 3 is a negative 7. Negative 7 squared is a positive 49 as well, because a negative times a negative. So we know that these solutions work, 10 and negative 4. If we look at this example, sometimes our solutions won't be integers, just like this one wasn't. So if we have our isolated uh, or our square factor isolated, we can introduce the square root. So when I introduce that square root, and I'm going to not show that step, but we'll, hopefully you understand what I'm doing. I'm taking the square root of both sides. So it's going to be plus or minus the square root of 27. The square root of 27 would simplify to 3 square root of 3. Because right? this contains a factor of 9, which is a perfect square. I take that square root, I get 3. And a factor of 3 would remain under the radical. Now, just like in this example, we still needed to isolate x. So I'm going to add 9 to both sides. And this one, I still have to eliminate this coefficient to get x all by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by 9. And when I divide this by 9 and that by 9, it's going to simplify to 1 plus or minus the square root of 3 over 3. Because this 3, when I divide it by 9, would reduce to 1 3rd. So 1 square root of 3 over 3. Now, to check our work for this one, it's a little bit more involved because this is not a nice answer. These are not like terms because of that radical, but this is the solution. I have 1 plus the square root of 3 over 3 and 1 minus the square root of 3 over 3. So to check that, we're going to clear some board space here. The original equation, 9 times x minus 9 squared equals 27. Well, the x value I'm going to test is going to be the 1 plus the square root of 3 over 3. And I'm going to do a little bit of distribution here, because this is a binomial. 
So when I do that, I get 9 plus, well, 9 times the square root of 3 over 3 would reduce. 9 over 3 is 3 square root of 3 minus 9 equals 27. Oh, I almost forgot that this quantity is squared. I can do some simplifying in here. 9 minus 9 is 0, so they cancel out. 3 square root of 3 squared. Well, 3 squared is 9 times the square root of 3 squared is 3. 9 times 3 is 27. That's a true statement. So I know 1 plus the square root of 3 over 3 is a solution. Well, the nice thing about having a perfect square is if uh, one of our solutions works, the other one will, because this is something we introduced in the last chapter called the conjugate. If, a, if you have a solution and its conjugate, you can rest assured that both will work. So you only really have to test one of them to check your solutions. But as we've seen here, we did get a true statement. So I know both of these work. Let's look at another example here. We have x squared minus 10x plus 25 equals 0. Now, I cannot isolate a uh, squared factor here because I have the variable in two different locations. This one's squared, but this one isn't. So hopefully our factoring skills are very sharp. And we can look at this and say, well, maybe I could factor it. The factors of 25 that sum to negative 10 would be negative 5 times negative 5, right? They have to have the same sign to give me a positive, but they would combine to give me a negative value. This is a perfect square trinomial. And if we can identify that, it's going to help us to solve this. So if I were to just factor it, we're going to get x minus 5 squared. So sometimes we can isolate that factor by using factoring and being able to identify some things that are uh, perfect square trinomials. So we have x minus 5 squared. Now, perfect square trinomials have a single solution. And if we look at this, if I were to take the square root of both sides using that square root property, well, the square root of 0 is 0. Plus or minus 0 doesn't matter. If it's plus 0, you get the same value as if you subtracted 0. So when I take the square root of both sides, I essentially get that factor equals plus or minus 0 is just 0. And now I can solve for it by adding 5 to both sides. Now, notice I only got one solution. And if I check it in the original equation, it will work. Uh, 5 squared is 25. 5 times negative 10 is negative 50. 25 minus 50 is negative 25 plus 25 is 0. So that solution works. Now, to identify a perfect square trinomial, um, if we have something that's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, essentially what we look at is that middle term. If these are perfect squares, your a uh, squared and b squared are perfect squares, as we saw here, x squared, 25 is a perfect square. The middle would be the product, or twice the product, of those uh, squares. So x and 5 would be their square roots. Twice that would give me negative 10. Twice negative 5 is negative 10. So we see this is twice their product. Now, this would be for a perfect square trinomial that has a positive. This would be a perfect square trinomial that has a negative. They're still perfect squares, but it's negative twice their product. So if we can identify that, that's going to help us. Now, there's a tool we can use if we don't have a perfect square, um, and it's called completing the square. We can take something and make it a perfect square trinomial. Now, to do that, the first thing we want to do is isolate the x's or isolate the variables to one side of the equation. Well, I can do that here by adding 2 to both sides. So let's do that. I'm going to add 2 to both sides. And I left a space here, and I did that intentionally because of what I'm about to do. To make this a perfect square trinomial, I ask myself, what would this value have to be to make this a perfect square? Well, if, uh, if we recall the formula there, twice this value or twice the product of these gives me that. Well, negative 2 and x, well, I'd have to say, well, what times x twice would give me this value? Now, 
<clears throat> the tool I'm going to use is 1 half of the b term squared. This is the value I need here to complete the square. Well, if I identify this as ax squared bx, I don't know what c is. What I can do is I can use this formula, 1 half of b. Negative 2 is b. So I'm going to take 1 half of negative 2 and square it. Well, half of negative 2 is negative 1. And negative 1 squared is 1. Now, I show this work every time I complete the square. This is in your best interest because we're going to refer back to this as we work through this problem. So I found the value of c that is required to make this a perfect square. And that's why it's called completing the square. So I'm going to add 1 because that's what I have here, a positive 1. But we always have to re recall the properties of equality. What I do to one side, I have to do to the other. Okay. So if I add 1 to this side, I need to add 1 to that side. This is now a perfect square trinomial. And regardless of what a, b, and c are, if we're going to use this tool, it will be a perfect square when we're all done. So I don't even really have to think about how it factors. I know it's going to be a perfect square. 2 and 1 is 3 here. It's a perfect square of x. And the value in here before I squared it is the value in here before I squared it. And the reason why I point that out is sometimes these coefficients aren't going to be nice. And because we're taking half of it, we might end up with a fraction. And to factor something that has fractions can sometimes be uh, a little difficult to see what those factors of that fraction would be. Well, if we refer back to this piece right here, this will always factor to what's in these parentheses before we squared it, is what will go in this parentheses before we'd square it to get back to that. So if you can recall that, it's going to be a little easier to factor, no matter what those coefficients are. But now that we've completed the square, this is now something that we can use the square root property on. I can take the square root of both sides. And if I take the square root of both sides, it gives me this factor plus or minus the square root of the other side of the equation. And now I can go ahead and solve that. I can add 1 to both sides. And I get x equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 3. 1 plus the square root of 3, and it's conjugate. So let's review what I just did there. To complete the square, the first thing we want to do is isolate the variable terms. Because we can't, they're not a perfect square, so we have to isolate the variable terms, essentially move any constant to the other side of the equation. Now, if the equation that I'm left with after I isolate the variable has an a coefficient other than 1, I want to divide all the terms by a. Because in order to complete the square, that coefficient of the x squared term has to be 1. So I divide all terms by a. And we'll see an example shortly of where we have to use that. Then we find 1 half of the b coefficient squared. This is your tool. Memorize this little piece here, 1 half b squared. Once we find that value, we add it to both sides of the equations because of the property of equality. What I do to one side, I do to the other. And then we can factor it because it is now a perfect square trinomial on one side of the equation. So we can factor it. Once we have that uh, factored to a perfect square, we can use the square root property to solve for x and then check our solution. So from uh, the last three steps are something that we already covered earlier in this video using that square root property. So let's look at a few examples uh, where we're going to complete the square. Here I have x squared plus 6x minus 18 equals 0. Now, I know that this isn't a perfect square. And it does factor, but we're not going to factor it. We're actually going to complete the square. The first thing I look at is a. I identify a, b, and c. a is 1. So I don't have to divide all the terms by uh, the coefficient a because it's already 1. So what I can do is isolate the variable terms. So I want to isolate those. And I can do that by essentially adding 18 to both sides. Now, I left this area open because I know I'm going to add a value 
to make that a perfect square. What value I add is 1 half of b squared. Well, b is 6. I've identified that. So half of 6 is 3. And 3 squared is 9. So I'm going to add 9 to both sides of the equation. What I do to one side, I do to the other. And now I'm ready to factor and simplify. This factors to a perfect square. That was the whole point of completing the square, to make that a perfect square. Well, I don't even have to think about how that factors. I can say, well, it's going to factor to this value before I square it would go in this value before you would square it, which is a positive 3, x plus 3 quantity squared. This side, 18 and 9, is simply 27. We just add those together. And now we're ready to use the square root property. If I take the square root of both sides, I get x plus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 27. Well, the square root of 27 simplifies to the square root of 3, or 3 times the square root of 3. And now to solve this, I subtract 3 from both sides. And my solutions are x equals negative 3 plus the 3 square root of 3 and negative 3 minus 3 square root of 3. And I can plug those back into the original equation and check them. Uh, but for time's sake in the video, we'll leave that for you to try. So why don't you go ahead and plug in one of these conjugates and check it and see that it does equal to 0. 0 equals 0. Now let's look at this example. And I said we would see an example where we would have to uh, identify a and then divide the terms through. Here, my a term is not 1. I have to make it 1 in order to use this tool of completing the square. So I'm going to divide all the terms by a. And actually, I should isolate the variable terms first. And I do that by subtracting 8. Now I can divide all the terms by a. Well, 2 divided by 2 is 1, and that's my goal, to have a 1 here. 14 divided by 2 is 7, and negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4. Now I'm ready to continue completing the square. I'm going to take half of b. Well, I recognize b to be 7 and square that value. Well, half of 7, we'll leave it as 7 halves. And if I square that, I get 49 fourths. 7 squared is 49. 2 squared is 4. 49 over 4. This is the value that I want to add to both sides, plus 49 fourths. What I do to one side, I do to the other. Now, I said factoring a fraction can sometimes be not very nice. But this does factor. And I don't really have to consider, well, what are the factors of 49 fourths that combine the 7th? It's actually right here. We already did the work. What's in here before I square it would be the value that goes in here before you square it. x plus 7 halves quantity squared is this perfect square trinomial. Now, on this side, we have to use some basic skills here. In order to add or subtract fractions, they have to have a common denominator. So negative 4, I'm just going to rewrite it as negative 16 fourths, because negative 16 divided by 4 is negative 4. Now I can actually combine these. Negative 16 fourths plus 49 fourths is going to give me 33 fourths. Now we're ready to use the square root property, because we have a perfect square isolated. If I take the square root of both sides, I get the factor x plus 7 halves equals plus or minus the square root of 33 fourths. And hope, hopefully, we will remember the quotient rule of radicals. If I'm taking the square root of a fraction, I can split it up to the square root of the top over the square root of the bottom. Well, the square root of 4 in this case would be 2. So I have x plus 7 halves equals plus or minus the square root of 33 over 2. And now I'm going to subtract 7 halves from both sides to get x by itself. And I'll write it right over here. x equals negative 7 halves plus or minus the square root of 33 over 2. So this is my solutions.
x equals negative 7 halves plus the square root of 33 over 2, and x equals negative 7 halves minus the square root of 33 over 2. Now, like I had said before, sometimes checking your solution can be more tedious than finding the solution. But when we have quadratics, we're going to get answers that aren't nice integers. These are the values that solve that equation. So definitely check your work. And that can be tedious, but it's best to check your work and, get, and know that you're right than to just hope that you're right. Now, this example here, I'm going to leave for you to do. I want you to complete the square on this example, y squared plus 6y plus 6 equals 0, to solve for y. So go ahead and try that on your own. This has been section 7.1, Solving Quadratic Equations. Thank you for watching.